Hi folks, this is John Ballantyne. All of us here at Campfire Radio Theater are very excited to tell you about our new sponsor, Red Apron. Red Apron delivers quality meals right to your door that are easy to make, taste great, and always at a low price. I'm sure our listeners enjoy a tasty home-cooked meal just as much as I do. Red Apron sends you everything you need to make a great meal with easy-to-follow instructions and all of the necessary ingredients. We are fortunate enough to have the head cook and CEO of Red Apron with us. He is going to walk us through the preparation of one of the great meals available through Red Apron. Thanks for taking the time to visit us here at Campfire Radio Theater, Mr. Cook. It's my pleasure, John. Glad to be here. Can you briefly tell us a bit about Red Apron first? Oh, absolutely. We are a family-owned and operated business based in Redmay. That's in Scotland, right? That's right, John. I come from a very long line of culinary talent. Many believe that it originated with my great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, Alexander. Rest his soul. They say he refined his skills while having to feed his family of 14 children with little to no money on hand. <laughs> well, having a son of my own with a bottomless pit for a stomach, I can only imagine trying to keep up with 14 kids. It must have been extremely difficult, requiring a lot of creativity and resourceful thinking to save money. Very perceptive, John. You know, one of the biggest selling points, aside from the fact that we serve only the finest meats using the most exquisite cuts, is that Red Apron is affordable. Speaking of, what are you preparing for us today, Mr. Cook? It smells absolutely delicious. I have picked out a simple yet very hearty stew. I've already prepped the neeps and tatties. That's uh, potatoes and turnips for y'all. But I have saved the best for last. Keep in mind that anyone can make a stew or stovies or any other garden variety of this dish. But what separates us from the competition is quite simply the meat. Pardon me for a moment, will you? Marshal, bring in the meat. So, we'll be catching up with Mr. Cook of Red Apron shortly after tonight's tale, and we'll be checking out just exactly what kind of delicious meal he's whipped up in the kitchen. Also, if you stay tuned after the credits, you'll hear a quick preview of a podcast that I've come to really enjoy called Twilight Histories. It's entertaining, it's dark, it's educational, and it's great listening for the Halloween season. Highly recommend it. I'm John Ballantyne, and I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome, friend. Have a seat by the fire. Make yourself comfortable. Even through her ghostly white pallor, Elizabeth retained some semblance of a sought-after young woman, a picturesque vision that even by the distortion of her face was still possible to imagine. Long silken locks hung down to her shoulders. She was a beauty, or must have been when she last walked amongst the living. But now, her mouth was agape in a look of sheer horror as if she had been gasping for air in her final moments. Her lips withered and gray, her eyes sunken, rolled into the back of her skull, milky white orbs that seemed to take in all and nothing. You're listening to Campfire Radio Theater. Tonight, a fresh feast for your ears, adapted from a haunting short story written by Patrick Moody. A gothic tale of Victorian London and the sins of science. We call it Death and Alchemy. It is the 29th of October as I commit these words to paper. The torch is nearly burnt out. 
All I can do is watch as it flickers, casting long, terrifying shadows across the walls. The shouts above have ceased. The hangman's mob now silent. Perhaps they've forgotten me. Forgotten my deeds. I know now as I rot alone in this dungeon, this may well be the last glimmer of light I ever lay eyes upon. Who knows what black visions may plague me in the coming days. For the dark is a cold, sinister thing, full of hunger and lost voices. These are crimes against humanity. You wretched bugger. The disease spreads daily. I am the mother of God's new creation. A soul. Can you provide a soul? Would you? Got one of them lying around. Aye, the we've heard the kind of work it you do. the birth of a new world. Dr. Hall. Dr. Hall. Dr. Hall. Dr. Hall. Uh, yes. Yes. This package. It's for you. Pa package? I'll slip it through the bars. What is it? Current events, Dr. Hawley. Newspapers. The Daily News, eh? London Terror, City in Panic is... Well, what is the meaning of this? This is some sort Troops of... Troops were called in to evacuate Buckingham Palace. Downing Street. It's an epidemic. There are thousands dead. Massacre in St. James's Square. Scores dead. Hundreds wounded. Bishop Gates set ablaze. Canterbury warns of Judgment Day? Scientists to blame for outbreaks this Parliament. This, this can't be true. Surely there's some error. Why do you think we keep you down here, Doctor, all to yourself? You hear those crowds up above? They aim to see you swing from the gallows. Or a tree. Captain, I'm a man of medicine. A man of science. After your arrest, I instructed my men to perform a thorough search of your home. We know what you did. I assure you, it was only in the interest of... Papers seized from your laboratory will provide sufficient evidence of your guilt. There is no doubt in my mind that it was your experiments that caused this chain of events. Your responsibility. How can that be? This plague is on you, Dr. Hawley. Be certain these papers will be used against you, should this case ever come to trial. What do you mean, should it ever come to trial? Have you not heard? London is burning. The city is afire. Let me be clear. I did not write this in the hopes of winning your favour. Nor do I desire any sympathy. I wish only to preserve the dignity of my name and to give a truthful account of the atrocities for which I am accused. I am sure they call me madman, heretic. As I have no legal recourse to address such matters, I am obliged to write my story on the slim offerings of parchment. No doubt these scribblings will be confiscated upon completion. And so, as I continue to write in spite of this. Perhaps I am truly mad, as they say. I must stress, my actions were purely driven by scientific pursuit. Unfortunately, the nature of my craft forced me to consort with those of, shall I say, questionable character. There's your lantern, though. Mind your step. Yes, thank you. So fetch the sickle to prop the metal that grows so near the bridge. Oh, dry bones, I will cause breath to enter you. And you shall live. I will lay sinews on you. And I will cause flesh to come upon you. Cover you with skin. And put breath into you. And you shall live. Now, what's that one? The Old Testament. Uh, the Bible. Don't really carry much of a tune, do it? Ezekiel, if I recall correctly. Ah, oh, good heavens. I nearly took a spill. Oh, hold your lantern high, Doctor. Yes. Take care. It's a black evening indeed. No moonlight at all. What about this one? Will it do? I think not. The Fresh Graves, where we might find a, a younger host. Aye. Want young, do ye? 
over yonder way, Elizabeth Tottenham, just the lass of seventeen, died of consumption, or so I hear. Ask me, was the opium did her in? Opium? And how would you know such things? Spend time working amongst the graves while the waking world sleeps. You learn a great deal. So I went to her mum's house. When the notion of restoring life to the dead, the reanimation of muscle and bone, became a fixation of a lifetime. An obsession that I carried with me throughout my years of medical schooling. I made this my life's mission and thrust myself into the world of science. If such works were possible for God, why not man? Here she lay. Your shovel, Doctor. There's only one. Aren't you going to help? Afraid not. Pardon me, but is this not your profession? Aye, it is. I dig. But I dig to put them in, not take them out. Have no worries. I'll keep watch on you. And I'll not speak a word of what transpires here this night. <sighs> Very well. This work of yours <sighs> seems a crazy thought. <sighs> Been round the dead my whole life. <sighs> Don't reckon any signs <sighs> to bring them back. Uh, you have a uh, little faith in my experiment. So the dead can be awakened, <clears throat> restored. It isn't a matter of waking them, Doc. It's a matter of souls. What do you mean? <laughs> the soul. Can you provide a soul? Got one of them laying around in that bag of yours. Years of meticulous research resulted in my crafting of a serum, which after testing on many a rat proved quite promising. I had found that which had eluded me for so long. The key to that impossible mystery that has haunted man since time immemorial. An elixir of life. With my calculations complete, I knew the experiments would need to begin. And for this, I was in need of a test subject. Basmagil. Basmagil. Are you still there, Basmagil? Hi. Take the rope, Doctor. Grab hold. We will load her casket onto my cab and be on our way to the laboratory. And then, my friend, the true adventure begins. Never was it my wish to disturb or disrespect the dead. Yet I needed them if I was to serve the living. It was a risk worth taking, I concluded. No matter the cost. This, this table. Set her here. Right. I must say, though not a man prone to nightmares, laying eyes upon Elizabeth gave me such a fright. I feared I should drop dead on the spot. Ah, beauty, ain't she? She was a beauty. It seems they did not attempt to fix her up. No, they wanted to be rid of this one. No fussing about. Died on Tuesday morning and had me digging by Tuesday night. Hmm. Curious. I tell you, it were the opium. Didn't have no sympathy for her. Poor little bird. Swept right under the rug. And of a good family, I heard tell. Well, I really do appreciate your assistance. Truly, I do. Um, now, if you'll excuse me, I must get to work. And I'm sure you'd like to find your bed. Ah, now, Doc. Listen here. I committed a sin this evening. Desecrated the ground I'd sworn to keep sacred. All to help you. And I'll be damned if I let ye throw me out. Surely you jest. No, sir. Well, why would you possibly... Now, Doc. Maybe that you're a madman. Maybe this in here won't wake up. But if it just so happens that you're right... I intend to see this through. Be ye monster or miracle worker. Very well. But let us be clear. This is not a game. Not some parlour trick. This is real. Now promise me you will follow every order with the severity in which it is given. <clears throat> promise me. I swear to ye. My word is yours. Good. 
We must bind her to the table. You see those leather straps at her wrists? What's this all about? We can't have her rise from the table, can we? <laughs> Thrashing about? Well, if she rises. Certainly. If she rises, we must take every precaution, should we not? Now tighten the restraints at her ankles. It needs to be tighter. No slack. But, but Dork... But nothing. She can't feel anything. Now make it tight, man. I don't care if you have to cut into skin. I will not have her moving about. <laughs> you really think she'll move, Doc? If we are successful, she'll do more than move. <laughs> now what? Now? Now, my good man, we will see if the dead can walk. After introducing the serum into empty veins, I agonized for those first minutes, that terrifying unknown between success and failure. I stared intently at Elizabeth, searching for any sign of movement. Working yet, is it? Her complexion had not changed. Her heart did not beat. Skin remained cold to the touch. By all accounts, she was still very much deceased. Only a shell. Cold and stiff and pale. Well, is it working, Doc? I hung my head in shame, cursing my very existence as a new horror swept over me. A realization that I become a man with no purpose. <sighs> well, Baspergill, it seems like we've done all we can. My experiments, my travels, my research, seemingly my entire life are for naught. <laughs> a few more pence for your troubles, my good grave digger. I retired to my chambers, collapsed onto the bed, fully clothed and smelling of death and alchemy. I did not dream that night, but even so, young Elizabeth visited me. I see the longing in your stare. You desire me even in this dreadful state. No. The lust in your heart. I feel it. No. The heart must have what it desires, my dear. Yes. Plant in me your seed. Give me life again. No. No, that's not how it's supposed to be. The serum Take my hand, my love. Ravage this body. No. Let us conceive. No, that's not how it's supposed to be. Let us give birth to a new world. <gasps> A new world. A new world. A new world. A new world. No! <laughs> that face haunted my sleep. Familiar. Did I know her? Perhaps pass her on the street? I could still feel Elizabeth's cold lips on my flesh. I could feel her hunger. What the devil? Passmigil! I made my way down to the laboratory. Passmigil! I passed through and into the scene of another nightmare. Where are you, Passmigil? What's happened down here? Orkdram! Mother of God! Aspergill, <laughs> who did this? The experiment. It worked. The corpse. Where is the corpse? Where is Elizabeth? Aspergill. The grave digger had been butchered. His throat nearly torn out. Limbs partially devoured as if by some ravenous beast. And Elizabeth. She was gone. I grabbed a sheet and set about wrapping him up bit by bit. 
the cloth growing heavy as I mopped up the blood like soup with a slice of bread. An overpowering stench of iron and death permeated the air. It was a nasty business. Most puzzling as I went about the grisly task of readying Baspergill's body for disposal. A set of bloody bare footprints that led to the doorway. A dread welled up in my stomach. Who could that be? It was still dark as pitch. The world is reborn, my love. Baspergill. He had said the experiment had worked. Yes? Who's there? Elizabeth? Is that you? The world is reborn. Elizabeth? Dr. Nathaniel Hawley? Yes? We have reports of some ungodly disturbance here. Disturbance? Mind if we come in and um, have a look about? I apologise, but there's no need for that. I have been working into the wee hours. Aye, we've heard the kind of work you do. Your neighbours reported screams from this residence, screams. Doctor. Our uh, duty is to investigate. Well, that's quite understandable, you see. I, I fell asleep in my laboratory and I had a rather dreadful nightmare. I awoke screaming. Dr. Hawley, what is that covered on the table behind you there? Would that be a body? Well, yes. Saints in heaven, it's a bloody mess. It's part of my work. Um, Move aside, Doctor. All right, let's have a look. Captain, I must protest. This is highly irregular. I... What the devil? Take a look at what's under the sheet. Have you no respect for the dead? That would be quite a joke were it not coming from you, Doctor. Sweet mother! <laughs> you must understand. This is bloody. Hell. This is all a grave mistake. Stand where you are, Doctor. <laughs> It's the local grave digger. Restrain him. This is not what it appears. You butcher. No. You must you must hear me out. You'll have your chance. Oh, still. Dr. Nathaniel no. Hawley, you are under arrest for the murder you, of Jeffrey Bradley. Uh, wait. Wait. This is a terrible misunderstanding. It's not how it appears. I, I'm no monster. I'm no monster. Oh. Elizabeth. She did not revisit my dreams again, yet her face still haunts me. Nathaniel, my love. What did she mean? The world is reborn. The world reborn. What could it possibly mean? Was it even a dream at all? Of one thing I am certain. The mob above, the people in the streets, they want to see me dead wish to see me hang for my deeds, for my experiments. You seem perturbed by the events you set in motion, my good doctor. I don't understand what's happening. You've held me here for weeks without explanation the or any... The evacuation is underway. As we speak, hundreds of boats are coming ashore to ferry the last of our citizens to the continent. The ones who still live. Am I to understand that they're evacuating the entire city? The entire country. How can that be? I only came here to share the news. I felt that you deserved one last chance. One last chance? To relieve yourself of your guilt. Confess to these crimes. I assure you, Captain, there was nothing in my work that could release any such you still blame. You don't comprehend, do you? Did you think there would be no consequence? Such is the folly of your kind. Tampering with things men are not meant to fathom. To play God? Without it's God, not wisdom. the original necromancer. Indeed, my ambitions were lofty, arrogant, blasphemous even. But my goal was to serve humanity. Serve humanity? You damned us. What in heaven's name led you down this path? I am cursed with... Curiosity. It's time to go, Captain. I'll be along in a moment. 
Curiosity, you say? You might be surprised to know I've long held a rather deep fascination with the Bible. Its depiction of miracles, angels and demons, the resurrection of the flesh, the rebirth of the dead. Your papers speak of a serum. After much research and many travels to exotic locales, I concocted my cure. A cure for death. And you used this cure on the Tottenham girl, the one exhumed from the graveyard? Yes. I administered the dose and fully believed the experiment had been an utter failure. I retired for the evening. By the time I had awoke, she had... Well, she had awoke as well. And escaped. There's something else. What is it? I thought it was a dream. But now I'm sure it wasn't. Elizabeth, the, the dead girl. She visited me as I slept. And yet you survived. You were not infected. No. She attempted to seduce me. Indulge in carnal passions. She spoke of rebirth. Of a new world. This dead Elizabeth. She could speak. She could reason as we do. Yes. How do you know it was Elizabeth and not something born from the pits of hell? She was an angel. As was Lucifer himself. Uh, Captain, the last train will be boarding soon. The truth is, Doctor, the sufferers of the plague, the infected, they do not think or speak. They are mindless. They know only hunger for the flesh of the living. Perhaps they seek what they no longer possess, a soul. Something your esteemed science can't give them. Elizabeth. She was... Most likely the originator of the plague. Why, yes. In a way, Doctor, you did give birth to a new world. A dead, decaying new world. Could be Elizabeth is your conscience, your guilt, speaking to you. No. If I should somehow survive this calamity, I must assure you, I will make it my charge to see that your name lives on for generations to come in the minds of those not yet born. Oh, yes. The new world shall know who its father is. We must leave now, Captain. On my way. It won't be the news for you. No. As for your personal well-being, well, I'd venture you're safer down here than on the street. So, sit tight, Doctor. Consider yourself safe and sound. Presently. Of all of my countless ruminations on death, never before had it occurred to me I would meet my end by starvation. Not a proper death for a doctor. Yet I must not dwell on the grumbling of my stomach or the smack of thirst on my lips. I have accepted my fate. I do not know how she entered the cell. Perhaps some vile joke by my captors. Though I feel certain they are long gone. Once again, she came to me in the night. I am here, my love. We can be finally united. Step from the shadows. Let me see you. Our world is nothing but shadow. Stay. Stay away from me. I don't wish to become one of your victims. <laughs> Do not fret, dearest. My desire for you is not carnivorous. I hunger for something else. What are you? I am Elizabeth Tottenham. You brought me back from the Vale of Death. Whatever you are, clearly it's not of this earth. Feel me. Am I not flesh? Are you not a man with yearnings as well? Yes. Is this not pleasing to you? You feel like a woman, but... My God, you're so cold. Hush, my darling, and take me. It is as it was meant to be.
I am unsure of what awoke me first. The gnawing hunger in my stomach. Or the bloodthirsty mob above. Elizabeth? She is gone. Elizabeth? Vanished. In fact, I cannot even be sure she was ever truly here. A mighty struggle has broken out in the streets above. The survivors have begun to riot. Roving gangs of godless men ravaging the city in a wake of terror. It sounds as if the mouth of hell has swallowed the world itself. They've broken through. I can hear them coming down the steps, shuffling along the stone. Surely they mean to stretch my neck for what I've done. I no longer fear the noose, though. I embrace its quick, merciful release. To die of hunger here, wasting away over countless hours, days to come, seems now a far more horrid fate. The first intruder rounds the corner, passes my cell. Please, I beg of you, let me out. Release me from... Oh, dear God. His face is grey. Expression dull. I look into his dark, unblinking eyes. They are not the hangman's mob that I originally feared. But something far worse. An endless, snaking procession of gaunt figures makes its way down into the dungeon. Just as I was told. It is indeed a plague of the dead. They throw themselves at the iron bars. Claw at the entrance of my cell. One is nearly thin enough to pass through. From a missing limb, lower jaws, pupils so dilated the entire eye is black as night itself. Yet I recognize that look in their eyes. I've grown to know it all too well these past few days. It is as the captain said. The infected are mindless, soulless creatures. They know only hunger for the flesh of those that remain. God, help me. Only hunger. What have I done? What have I done? Embrace your children, my love. For we have given birth to a new world. A new world. been listening to Campfire Radio Theatre. Tonight's tale, Death and Alchemy, was based on a short story by Patrick Moody and adapted, produced, and directed for this series by John Ballantyne. Featured in the cast were Owen Bevan as Dr. Hawley, Kareem Cronfley as the captain, Erica Sanderson as Elizabeth, Rish Outfield as Basbegill, and Robert Cudmore as the Constable. Music by Kevin Hartnell and Alan Howarth. Sound design by John Ballantyne. Additional sound, courtesy of Free Sound Project. Mixing and post-production by John Ballantyne. Share the horror and visit us at CampfireRadioTheatre.com and on Facebook at Campfire Radio Theatre.
breathtaking landscapes, mythical creatures, a people cast from the frozen rocks, time travel to a world of adventure, ritual, and mystery. Time travel with the Twilight Histories podcast. It's said that when Alexander conquered East, the Buddha conquered West. Now the Greek world is finally, finally at peace. The trumpets rumble from the Acropolis while you debate the Dharma and the Agora. Do not dwell in the past. Do not dream of the future. Just be. Time travel with the Twilight Histories podcast. Marshal, bring in the meat. Thank you, Marshal. That will be all. It is my personal philosophy that the sooner you get the meat from the butcher to the table, the better. Screwdriver. Pliers. What a mess. Uh. (laughs) Hammer. Having said that, would you like to do the honours, John? It would be my pleasure. Ready? You betcha. Fire away! Jolly good show. I take it you have some prior experience. Spent part of my teen years helping out down at a local slaughterhouse when I lived in Texas. (laughs) Right. Very good, very good. Shall we? Mr. Cook, I've got to hand it to you. That was one of the best meals I have ever eaten. It was obviously quick and easy to prepare, and it didn't cost me an arm and a leg. Thank you, John. Our family takes great pride in bringing you only the best we can offer. At Red Apron, we truly believe that our secret ingredient is the people. <laughs> That's right, folks. You, too, can enjoy the tasty meals created by Red Apron in the comfort of your very own home. No trips to the grocery store or waiting in line. Red Apron delivers. Once again, that's Red Apron. If you sign up now, you'll get the first three meals for free. No vegetarian options are currently available at this time. Be sure to visit redapron.com slash campfire to take advantage of this great offer, Red Apron, where you can expect only the finest meats, the most exquisite cuts. <laughs> 